If you have your Bibles with you this morning, please open them up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. We continue our walk with Luke as he's talking to us about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And today we come to uh, a time when Jesus has asked a question. And the title of the sermon is, It's All About Jesus. And, you know, I've been made fun of in the past by people who are no, long, no longer a part of Southfield Christian Fellowship. I, I told them to leave uh, when they made fun of me, but how many sermon titles have the word Jesus in them and uh, other things like that. But in all honesty, uh, it really is all about Jesus. And, and we're going to see this in some subtle ways and in some very uh, obvious ways today. Um, What's going to happen today is this. Jesus is going to talk about things that are about to happen in his life and in his ministry. And as Jesus is answering this question of these people who are are asking him about the, the lack of spiritual disciplines on the part of his disciples, he's going to begin to teach a very important lesson about his kingdom. And what Jesus has done is he has inaugurated his kingdom with his arrival on earth through the incarnation and through the through the virgin birth, and, and, and that's here at the beginning of his ministry. And one, there's a couple of things that I want us to see as we go forward from today's, uh, today's passage. One is, that, again, I want us to walk away with a, a sense in which we begin to see, if we haven't already, how all of life revolves around Jesus. It makes a difference that he was here in everything. Now, the world will... The world will disregard this. The world will, will dispute this. The world will not say, no, history is not all about Jesus, but it is. And one of the ways in which we know that it is is because of what Paul said in Philippians 2 when he said, hey, you know, when, it, when all is said and done, every name, every, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And as we've said before, some will do so willingly. Others will do so through clenched teeth. So all of history revolves around Jesus. But it's not just the fact that history revolves around Jesus. It's also the fact that Jesus has initiated a a new kingdom that cannot be mixed with the old kingdoms. That's what we're going to see today. So let's look at our passage this morning, and we'll read that together. And we see here, it says in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 33, And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And he also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good." So here's how we're going to break it down this morning. Just two very simple divisions. Jesus in history and Jesus in the new kingdom. Everything in life revolves around Jesus. Let's begin by talking about, about Jesus in history. As we look at our passage today, as we begin to, to look into it, you know, we're, we're, we're struck with this fact that somebody came and asked Jesus a question, or they, or they came and they made an observation to him. Our first impression could be that it's the Pharisees and those that he's been interacting with in the other uh, passages that we've seen in, in Luke chapter 5. It could have been them. Matthew 9, which, which carries Matthew's account of this, of this very same interaction, says that it was the disciples of John who came to him and said, Hey, Jesus, we've noticed this about your disciples. They don't fast and they don't, they don't pray like, like the disciples of John do and, and, uh, and, and like the disciples of the Pharisees do. As I, as I was meditating on this, you know, this last couple of weeks, you know, that question came to mind. Did the disciples of Jesus ever come to him and go, Hey, Lord, how come we don't do things like other people do? There was a time they did something sort of like that, and that's the reason we have the Lord's Prayer. 
They came to Jesus and they said, Hey, Jesus, would you teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to do? You see, one of the things that that has been on my mind in the last couple of years is is how much we're like Israel in the Old Testament. You know, God had had said that he was going to be the God of Israel. He had taken them out of a captivity in Egypt and taken them through the Exodus and into the Promised Land. And then God was, was ruling them and God was giving them direction. And the time came that the Israelites came to God and they said, Hey, or they, they came to Samuel the prophet and said, Hey, we want to be like all the other nations. We want to have a king like they have. Note to Christian self, you always get into trouble when you say... We want to be like other people, okay? That's just, that's just the reality. It never ends up good. So these questioners come to Jesus, and they make this observation to him. They said, the disciples of John fast often and often offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. Why did they choose these two things to, to pick at? Well, the reality is, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament only calls for one day of fasting. That's, on, that's the only fast that's required, and that's on the Day of Atonement, and that's found in Leviticus chapter 16. But the Mishnah went, went further than that to say, you know what, there are three kinds of fasts that, that, that Jews ought to engage in. And these included uh, fasting for national tragedies, fasting in times of crisis, such as war, plagues, drought, or famine, and also any number of self-imposed fasts that you may want to enter into. Now, we see several different fasts in the Old Testament, and it's okay if we, if we follow them. It's okay if we engage in them. But there was only one that was required, but as time went on, people began to add to what God's Word explicitly stated. No, if you're really faithful, if you're really devout, you're going to fast on these other three occasions as well. So that by the time we get to, to Jesus' day, the Pharisees had a habit of fasting on every Monday and every Thursday. So if you wanted to be a devoted follower of God, you would fast on every Monday and every Thursday. Well, the problem with their fasting was it focused on sorrow and it, and it focused on, on mourning. Prayer and fasting had become the indicators of orthodoxy and of devotion. One of the interesting things that we see in this passage is that, you know, the, the question or the, the statement was made to Jesus having to do with fastings and prayer. And Jesus just talked about the fasting. He didn't talk about the prayer. The prayer that's probably being alluded to is the different times of the day in which the Jews would pray at the, te- at the temple. And you know, we saw this in Acts chapter 10 when we talked about how it was that uh, God called Peter to go and and. and preached the gospel to the household of Cornelius. Peter had gone up on the rooftop to pray about the sixth hour of prayer. And this was a time of prayer when when Jews would typically gather in the temple to pray. And so it's interesting that Jesus addresses the fastings here, but he he doesn't really address the prayers. But here's the big thing that we're going to see. When Jesus is, when he's, he's talking to them about the way in which they fast... He knows that the context in which they are fasting, it's a sorrowful thing. It's a a time of mourning because something bad has happened. But look at how he answers their question. He answers sorrow and mourning with joy. Because in verse 36, he then begins to talk about, or in verse 34, he begins to talk about a bridegroom and a wedding feast. Now, we know from the Old Testament that, that there are many allusions in the Old Testament to the, to the use of a groom and a wedding to express God's relationship to his people. And we know that the New Testament often talks about how the church is the bride of Christ. And so it's appropriate then that Jesus puts himself in the picture of the person who is the bridegroom. And, and think about what he is saying here. When a, when a bridegroom is, when a, when a feast is being thrown because a groom and a, and a, and a bride are coming together uh, to be married, it's not a time of sorrow. It's not a time of, of, of mourning. It's a time of joy. For a virgin who was being married, the, the, the Jewish um, calendar said that the feasting was to go on for seven days. Well, yeah, you like that, do you? Yeah. And here's what you'll like even better. 
lots of food, lots of wine, lots of dancing. Now, if it's a remarry, if it's a widow who is being remarried, the feast was cut down a little bit. It's only three days. But still, you know, we think it's a, we think it's a long word deal if we have a, a six-hour wedding, okay? You know? Um, so the, the point that Jesus is, is picturing, is, is painting for us here, the picture that he is painting is as that of a time of, of great joy. And so think about it. What would it be like if we had a wedding feast and we had invited everybody to come to the wedding feast? And in the context of that wedding feast, we said, okay, now you must fast. It'd be totally inappropriate because you don't fast at the wedding. You may fast leading up to the wedding, but you don't fast at the wedding. And so Jesus is saying, you know, the reason that they are not fasting is because I am with them. But then look at what he says there in verse 35. In verse 35, he says, he alludes to the fact that Jesus is not always going to be with his disciples. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, And then they will fast in those days. Usually at a wedding feast, it's not the bridegroom who leaves, it's the guests who go home. And they leave when the feast is over. But the picture that Jesus is painting here, it's a foretelling of what is going to happen to him. He already knows that opposition is forming to to his ministry. And and we've seen much of that opposition already in what's happened in these these previous two stories that that we have looked at. And we see also that Jesus says here in verse 35, it's not that he is going to choose to leave those who have come to the feast, but he is going to be taken away from them. So already here in chapter 5, Jesus is pointing toward the end of the Gospel of Luke toward his arrest, toward his trial, toward his crucifixion, and then ultimately toward his resurrection. And he says, the bridegroom is going to be taken away from them, but and when that happens, my disciples are going to fast. But what kind of fasting will they engage in? It won't be sorrowful fasting. It won't be the fasting of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth because times are so bad and things are so evil. It will be fasting that is informed by the fact that they have been with Jesus and they know what he is like and they can't wait for him to return. The story is told about what Ruth Graham, the wife of of evangelist Billy Graham, used to do when Billy was away on his worldwide crusades. She tells the story herself. She said that many nights she would take one of his jackets to bed with her. And she would curl up with that jacket and maybe put it around a pillow in the bed next to her because that jacket had Billy's scent on it, the scent of his cologne. And she knew that on a certain day Billy was going to be coming home. And so she would sleep with that jacket as a reminder of the one that she was waiting for, the one whose whose return she anticipated, the one who made her glad, the one who gave her joy. The disciples of Jesus, when they fast after he has been taken away from them, this is the way in which they are going to fast, with a sense of anticipation, with a sense of joy. This is what we see happening with the church in the book of Acts. You know, one of the things that we're going to see in the Gospels is that Jesus never says, don't fast. You know, in in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, hey, when you fast, do it this way. But Jesus also never says that fasting is the indication of our devotion to him. Yes, we should fast. But the church in the book of Acts, it fasted because it needed guidance. When you and I fast today, what we are doing is we are setting aside some kind of of physical activity or physical appetite that brings us pleasure. And we're we're voluntarily setting it aside for a, a specified period of time to remind ourselves that even if we have all of whatever it is that we're setting aside temporarily, even if we have all of that, that is not enough to satisfy us that we need our relationship with Jesus. And so we voluntarily set some of those things aside as a reminder 
and to whet our appetite and our sense of anticipation for what's going to come. We need to fast. We need to fast on a regular basis, not just once a year when when we have our week of prayer. We need to fast on a regular basis because fasting keeps us watchful. And when we fast, it's not with a... It's not with a hopeless sense of, oh man, I sure hope God hears me. I sure hope he knows what kind of a, of a mess I'm in. I sure hope he knows, you know, what's in front of me. That's not at all the, the way in which we fast. When you and I fast today, we do it with the understanding and the conviction that God already sees. God already knows. And God wants to answer us. The fasting is more for us than for God. Because we need to make sure that we are honed in on what he has to say and the way in which he wants to say it. So this is what we see when, when these people come to Jesus and they, and they make this comment. When they say, your disciples don't act like the other disciples, how come? And his answer is, it's because I'm with them. But the day's going to come that I'm not going to be with them. And then things are going to change. History revolves around Jesus. Our lives revolve around Jesus. Brothers and sisters, there never comes a time that we have all of the Jesus that we need to have. There never comes a time when we move away from Jesus onto, into the, to the, to the deeper things of the Spirit. We're always focused and stayed upon Jesus. But Jesus didn't stop there. He went on to give them a parable. Now, Actually, he went on to give them three parables. I've listed here uh, the, the places in Mark and Matthew where this, th- these, this passage is in also included in these other two gospel writers. There are some things that are unique about Luke's version of this story that's a little bit different than Matthew and Mark's. But here's what you need to know. All three of the gospel writers come to the same conclusion. And that is that you cannot use the new to repair the old, because if you try to do that, you're going to ruin them both, okay? So let's look at some things that are, that that will help us to understand what, um, uh, part of what what Luke is doing here, part of what Jesus is saying here when he talks to these people who've come to him. Let me give you this definition. What is a parable? And, And see, here's one of the things that you need to see about this passage. With Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke is the only gospel writer who specifically says, and now Jesus told them a parable. Luke brings it to the attention of of his readers. Matthew and Mark, they tell the parable. They just don't say, and now Jesus told them this parable. So so this is a good thing to do. What What is a parable? A parable is a pictorial comparison between something familiar and known or a spiritual truth or reality. Okay? So... How are we supposed to go about and, and interpret parables? This also comes from Michael Lawrence. And, and this, this will be in the notes that will go out later. Uh, so you don't have to write this down now, but I just want to bring them up. You know, Lawrence says, when you're interpreting a parable, one of the questions that you have to ask is, what's the main point? What's the main point of this parable? Because it'll, it'll have one main point. And then he says, you need to pay attention to repetition. Reversal of expectations or change in voice. And then he says a parable is kind of unique because the conclusion or the main point of the parable is typically at the end. Not at the beginning, not in the middle. It's typically at the end. And it usually centers on the nature of the kingdom or the king. And then finally he says, hey, context is still king. So interpret parables in light of the context of the larger surrounding narrative. So how would we interpret that? How would we do that here with what Luke is giving us in chapter 5? So the first thing that, that we said is, that, that, that Lawrence says is, he asks this question, or he says, what's the main, he says, the most important question to ask about a parable is, what's the main point or points? Well, as I interpret it, the main point of these parables, and there are three here, that are given in rapid-fire succession, all saying the same thing, the main point of all these is you can't mix the old and the new. He says if you do that, you're going to tear the new, and and it's not going to work on the old. 
or you're gonna, or you're gonna, you're gonna mess up the old and the new both. You're gonna put, you know, fresh wine into old wine skins, and you're gonna ruin both the wine skin and the wine. You're gonna spill the wine. All right. So what's the point of the parables? Well, you can't mix the old and the new. Lawrence then says, so pay attention to repetition, the reversal of expectations or changes in voice from first to third person. In these three parables, Jesus introduces each parable in a new way in verses 36, 37, and 39 when he says, no one, no one. Verse 36, he says that no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it in an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. That's the first one. Verse 37, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And the third one, verse 39, and no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good. So we do see repetition in this parable, or in these three parables. The third point that Lawrence said was, the conclusion or main point is typically at the end and usually centers on the nature of the kingdom and the king. Well, the concluding point to these parables is this. The Pharisees are not going to accept the kingdom that Jesus is inaugurating because they are comfortable with what they have now. See, that's the one that that I had the hardest time with as I was looking at this and studying and thinking about it. Because so often when I'm looking at, at verse 39, and, and it's, Jesus says, And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. I thought, what in the world is he saying? After he said all this stuff about the new stuff, is he saying that the new is not desirable because it's not old? No. Here's the thing to, to see about verse 39. Verse 39 is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. Jesus is not saying... If you're satisfied with the old, you shouldn't desire the new. What Jesus is saying is the Pharisees especially will not desire the new because they are comfortable with the old. And that's where the problems are going to come from. And then finally, Lawrence says, context is still king. So interpret parables in light of the context of the larger surrounding narrative. What's the larger surrounding narrative? The larger surrounding narrative is that Here in chapter 5, already we are seeing opposition to Jesus forming. We saw this in the healing of the paralytic a couple of, of, of stories ago, where Jesus healed this man, where he forgave the man of his sins in front of the Pharisees and the teachers and the scribes who had come to, to check out his ministry. And they, they got all upset. They didn't say anything out loud, but they were, they were thinking it. So Jesus spoke their thoughts out loud. And he says, why do, you, why do you question whether or not I have the ability to forgive sin? Just to prove that I have the ability to forgive sin? Take up your mat, rise and walk. And the guy does that and he goes home. So the opposition is seen in, in that story. And then last week, the story of, uh, or the, the, story of the calling of Levi Jesus sees Levi at work. He sees Matthew at work. He is sitting in his toll booth and he says, hey, you follow me. Matthew gets up and he follows immediately. He follows, he follows after Jesus. And what does Matthew do? He is so excited about what he has done. He throws a party. Who does he invite to the party? He invites the people whom he knows best, the other tax collectors and sinners. And he wants them to meet Jesus, and he wants Jesus to be with him. And Jesus goes, and he's, he's taking the initiative to go after these people who are far from his father. And Jesus is sharing the gospel with them. He is not confirming them in their sinfulness, but he is simply confirming the offer of grace that God is making to them. And the Pharisees hear about this, and they are concerned, they are disgruntled, and they begin to, to complain to Jesus' disciples. Why does he hang out with Pharisees and and, and with tax collectors and sinners? Doesn't he know that he's going to defile himself if he does this? Jesus is not concerned about defiling himself by outward actions. Jesus is more concerned with offering grace to those who need it and those who are humble enough to receive it. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees today, you like the old wine. And because you're satisfied with the old wine, you are not going to accept the new wine. 
You're not going to be willing to put on a new garment. You're not going to be willing to be put into a new wineskin. You're not going to be willing to taste the new wine. Jesus' eyes are open to the opposition he faces. Now we know from our readings of the Gospels, and we'll see this as we work through the, through the Gospel of Luke over the next decade, uh, we, we know that they're going to be trying to trap Jesus. They're going to be trying to, to cause him to do, to, to, to do a misstep. And we know that there are times that Jesus is going to deliberately alter his traffic pattern because it's not time yet. Jesus is not afraid of them. This is what he has come for. But he will do it on his terms, in his Father's timing, when it's time. But all of this, brothers and sisters, one of the things we're going to come back and talk about in a little bit is we should not be surprised. We should not be surprised when we live in the new kingdom and we face opposition from those who want to remain in the old, in the old kingdom. So how does this impact us today? Well, one of the ways in which this impacts us today is this. Our spiritual disciplines are about a person, not about a ritual. Jesus is the center of the Christian life. There's, there's no other way about it. John Piper wrote a book a few years ago, um, which has a great thesis that, that, that goes perfectly here. He said, um, if you could, would, would you be happy to go to heaven? And Jesus wasn't there. Would you be happy to go to heaven and see your loved ones who've gone on before you and enjoy eternal life and have the trouble-free existence? Would you be satisfied with that if Jesus were not there? And his point being, if you are, you may not be a Christian. Because, yes, we are going to see our loved ones who've gone before us. But primarily, we're going to see Jesus. And, and, and what we're doing right now as we go through life on this earth, we're revolving our lives around Jesus in preparation for what we're going to do there. So, how does this impact us? Well, let's, let's talk about this in the light of spiritual disciplines. And so the first thing that I've said here is we read all of Scripture in light of Jesus. Now, this was not a big thing that Jesus made. This was not a big point that he made in this passage. But it's true nevertheless. He said, my disciples don't fast right now because I'm with them. But when I'm not with them, they will. Their lives are going to change when I'm no longer physically with them on the face of this earth. The way that that impacts us when, we, when we're talking about reading Scripture is this way. All of Scripture is about Jesus. When, and, and we should be, we, the, 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 the phrase that I like to use, we should be in all of Scripture all of the time. From, the, from, from wherever we are today until the day comes that, that we, we no longer can see with our eyes because God has closed them in death, we need to be in Scripture every day. And we need to be in all of Scripture on a regular basis, not just in one part of Scripture. Why? It's because all of Scripture is all about Jesus. When we're reading in the New Testament, we're, we're reading about how people were looking forward to his coming and how God was giving clues and God was giving hints of the one who was to come and how, how so many of the things that, that could not be fulfilled in the Old Testament that could not be totally understood with this limited glimpse of what was going to happen in the future, how when Jesus comes and he fulfills it all, all of a sudden it's going to make sense. So when we're reading in the Old Testament, we're always reading it, having an eye, keeping an eye open to the fact that Jesus is going to come and he's going to fulfill this. If we can read the Old Testament and totally ignore Jesus, then we're not reading it right. We have to have Jesus. And then when we're in the Gospels, we're reading about what Jesus said and did. We're looking at this and we're marveling going, Father, this is how you've revealed yourself to us. I know something about what you are like because of how I am seeing Jesus. And, and I, I have an idea of, 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 the, of the things that matter to you, of the, of the values that you have. I have a great idea of the things that make you angry. I have an idea of who it is that you chose to spend time with and, and how I should spend my life. I see these things that you said. I see these things that you did. 
I have an idea what you are like, and it helps me to, to think about relating to Jesus as a person. And then when we go to the book of Acts and, and the New Testament books after that, we're looking at why does it matter that Jesus came? How does that impact life ever since? So we're either looking forward to his coming, we're looking at what he did when he was here, or we're looking at the impact of what his life has meant. We read all of Scripture in light of Jesus. And we engage in certain spiritual disciplines that will cause us to have a desire for a relationship with Him. These questioners have talked to Jesus about the spiritual disciplines of fasting and prayer. I've talked to you about the discipline of reading. I love, I love spiritual disciplines. I, one of the things that, that, that God has done in my heart over the years, he's, he's given me the ability to establish some, just some rituals that help me to know Jesus. I was sharing, I think it was with our lit group recently. You know, my ritual in the morning when I get up and I go to my, I go to my study, the first thing I do is I journal to just kind of unload whatever it is that's on my mind or my heart after being asleep. The second thing I do is I read scripture, doing my, my regular reading plan. Slowly, I read out loud because it helps me to, to see it. It helps me to say it. It helps me to hear it. It, causes, it slows me. I, can, I can't read out loud as fast as I read silently, so it causes me to slow down. Then I'll spend time on, on my scripture memory, and, and that becomes very meditative the further I go into a particular book that I'm memorizing because I'm, I'm, I'm reciting everything that I know in that book up until now and learning a new verse. And all that is doing is it's just filling me. I've, I've unloaded myself now. I've filled myself up with Scripture. And then when it's time to pray, I'm praying out of what God has been doing. And I'm praying for you guys on a regular basis. And I'm, I'm connecting Scripture with what I know about what's going on in your lives uh, and, and all of this is just coming forward. And it, it all sounds mechanistic. It all sounds mechanical. Maybe that's the better word. But as long as I remember that all of this is for the purpose of having a relationship with a person, I'm okay. But if I ever slide off into thinking I'm acceptable to God because I do this stuff every day, that's where I get in trouble. Doing this stuff doesn't make me right with God. But doing this stuff helps me to have a relationship with God. So I think one of the things that we do is we build into our lives a sense of ritual that will help us to have a relationship. Here's a ritual that Kara and I instituted. I'd like to say so many years ago, but over the life we've been married now, Almost 38 years? Hey. Yeah, that's good. I can remember, okay? <laughs> 38 years in June. But um, uh, one of the things that we've, that we've become pretty adamant about, a ritual that we've become pretty adamant about, is that we pursue a disagreement or an argument until it's resolved. And, and some of that, you know, it, it's simply because... Uh, the way that Kara and I are, 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 are created, Kara's the one that really wants to resolve things. I would like to just sweep it under the rug and go on, you know? Uh, comes time to go to sleep at night, I never have trouble going to sleep, okay? It'll keep Kara up if we don't resolve it, okay? So for the sake of my marriage, for the sake of my wife's health, but for the sake of being obedient to God and having a better relationship with my wife, I'm committed to pursuing it. Now, that means that sometimes I have had to quit lying flat on my back in bed to sit up in bed, cross-legged, or even get out of bed so that I'm uncomfortable, so that I am awake, so that I can pursue resolving this. But in pursuing the, the resolution of it, there's another important aspect, and that's my attitude. Because one of the things that I've learned, if I am angry because I'm having to stay awake to resolve this argument, that's going to create more problems than it solves. I have to, I have to be sweet. 
I have to be patient. I have to be kind. Even if it's 2 a.m. and I need to get up at 5 or 6, it's what I have to do. Peter, I'm in the process of, of re-memorizing 1 Peter, and I'm getting ready to come up to Peter's section in chapter 3 when he talks about relationships between husbands and wives. Peter says to the wife, he says, you know, focus more on the content of your character and the content of your heart rather than the amount of jewelry you wear, the way you fix your hair, the clothes you wear. Focus on the content of your character and your heart and be respectful of your husband. And he even uses that dreaded S word. He uses the word submission. Be submissive to your husband. And then he says to the husband, he says, husbands, you know, love your wives. Treat them as the weaker vessel, not meaning that they're not equal, but treat them as vessels that need to be protected. They're fragile. And so Peter, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, gives us a ritual that we should go through that will facilitate having a relationship with the particular person that we're married to. I think one of the biggest things that happens to us so often with, with, with conflict in marriage is we, we want to be married to somebody other than who we are married to. We're married to the person we're married to, and that's the person that we need to learn how to live in peace with and how to grow in the relationship with. Jesus said, he never said, don't, don't fast. But the implication is, going forward from him, is when we engage in these spiritual disciplines, we do so with certainty and we do so with expectation. We do so with a sense of joy. So when it comes time in January and we have our week of prayer and fasting, and we choose to fast at whatever reason, at whatever level. And you notice that we never tell you how you have to fast or what you have to fast from. We invite everybody to join into a fast with us. But when you do so, it should be with a sense of excitement and joy. Not, oh, a week without French fries. How am I going to make it through the week without French fries, you know? Instead... I'm excited to see how the Lord is going to speak to me this week. And, and here are the things that I think I need to hear from him. And at the end of the week, here's what he said. Here's, here's what happened. Jesus' disciples engage in spiritual disciplines so that we can know Jesus better. We use the rituals, but the rituals are not an end in themselves. The rituals lead us into a relationship this also impacts us this way. Jesus said talking about this new kingdom. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't come out and use the word kingdom here in the passage that we're looking at this morning, but that's what he's talking about. He's implementing this new kingdom, and it is going to be in conflict with the old kingdom. And so one of the things that, that Jesus is saying, and again, Here's, here's the thing that, we, that I started talking about last week that I'm still thinking about. God is a God who loves process. And he will not cut the process short just because we find it to be uncomfortable. When God created the, the earth, he, he could have done everything all at once. But he chose to do it in seven days. When God saved you and I, he could have... He, he could have changed our lives instantly and not only justified us, but he could have sanctified us all at once. But instead, what he does is he, he, he calls on us to walk through this process with him. And if we, if we want to delay things, we, we can. We can delay things through disobedience and we can delay things through, through not just paying attention to the program and not paying attention to him. But he wants to walk us through this process. But one of the things that we see today is this fact that this new kingdom is not gonna is not gonna match with the old kingdoms that he's called us out of. Let me tell you a story. It's been 30 years. It was 30 years in March when God called Kara and I, and at that time Nelson and Caitlin, out of the country back into the Metroplex. And we came. We came first to Dallas and then to Arlington because we felt like God was calling us to be involved in church planting. 
And at the time that he did so, we didn't have any resources whatsoever. Uh, we, were, we were stepping out in faith. Uh, in some ways, we had been a little bit foolhardy in some of the things that we had done, but we'd taken this large step of faith. For those of you who don't know the story, at the time that we moved from the country, I had been pastoring a church for three years. We were joining up with this ministry here that was going to be doing simultaneous church planting of three churches. I did not have a job. We had enough money to live on for a month. We had an apartment that was provided for us, but in a month, everything's going to run out. At the end of that month, God provided me with two part-time jobs. I would clean swimming pools in the morning, and then I would work in in a bank call center in the afternoon, early evening. And that's how we survived for that first year. The second year, we moved from Dallas into, into Arlington um, because of a possibility of, of pastoring a church in Arlington that was getting started and, and doing all of the ministry that, that we felt like we, that God was calling us to do. We still did not have any resources. And in those days, I began to read something called Success Magazine. Now, if Jim Muir were here today, Jim would probably know the magazine that I'm talking about. It was, it was, a, it was a fairly well-known magazine, you know, 30 years ago. But in Success Magazine, I began reading about all these things that, you know, that you would think of would be a part of what the world would say you have to do in order to be successful. Well, one of the columnists who wrote regularly for Success Magazine was the man who was responsible for Formula 409. Have y'all ever heard of Formula 409? Do you know how Formula 409 got its name? It's because formulas 1 through 408 did not work. So that's how the product was named Formula 409. Hey, this is the winning, this is the winning solution to, to do the cleaning product that we want to do in the kitchen. And so the entrepreneur who was behind Formula 409 regularly wrote a column for, for Success Magazine. And and, and, and again, what these things do is they always appeal to your baser instincts. What was my base instinct at the time? Well, my, my spiritual instinct was I want to be successful in planting churches. The baser instinct was I want to get the credit for it. How am I going to do that? And so what this columnist kept, kept talking about in his columns was he said, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to sacrifice everything to be the entrepreneur. And that means you have to sacrifice family. That means forget about going to your kids' birthdays, kids' baseball games, all of that. And here I was, stepping out in faith, trying to do something that I really felt like God was calling me to do, and I'm taking in this material that is diametrically opposed to doing things God's way. And at some point in time, I kind of woke up. It's kind of like, I can't do that. I can't do that. I am not going to sacrifice my family. My family may be my first field of ministry. It's definitely not my only field of ministry. But I'm not going to sacrifice my family just so that I can have some sense of ministry success. All of that to say, I've shared this with a lot of you in a lot of different ways and a lot of different times. Being a bivocational pastor is not easy. But the fact that it's not easy, the fact that it can be hard does not mean it's wrong. You see, too often these days, we have this idea that if something is hard, if something is difficult, then there must be something wrong. No, that's not it at all. Being bivocational has not been easy, but God has given me the grace to be able to do so without losing my marriage, without losing my family, and doing it to the glory of God. I wish that in 1992... And in 1993, I, had, I, had, I knew all of the things about walking with God that I know in 2022. But how do I know these things today? I know them because I have walked with God in 1992, 93, 94, 95, all the way up until today. And it's been a process. It's been a process. But what has enabled me to be able to more and more disregard, disregard the old kingdom and grasp hold of the new kingdom? It's been, it's been passages like Lamentations 3. You guys know, the, you, you know this, the, these two verses here in verses 22 and 23. 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We love those verses. Those verses are written in a time of destruction. Those verses are written in a time when Jerusalem is under siege. Those verses are written in a time when there is absolutely nothing to hope in because everything is crumbling. It's all falling apart. And in the middle of that, the writer says, God's mercies are new every morning. Grasp hold of the new kingdom. Go for the new kingdom. It may not be easy. And there will be people in the old kingdom who laugh at you who say, you fool, you idiot, you're on the wrong side of history. You're not. You're walking in the new kingdom. You're walking in the new kingdom. And God gives mercy every day to his children so that they can walk. The way in which I would sum it up after all of these years, after these 30 years, is what I have here in the second bullet point. I cannot grasp what I want to be without letting go of what I've become. There never comes a time when God is through working, ever. And I'm, I'm glad for the things that I've gone through. They're not wasted. But there's never a time that I can sit down and say, that's it, that's enough, that's all that I'm going to do. No, no. There's more. Until the day I die, there's something new every day. Brothers and sisters, one of the testimonies that goes out about Southfield Christian Fellowship is this. There is a sense of life here. There is a sense of love. There is a sense of community. That comes because you and me and Ben and Tim, and Russell, and John, it comes because we have decided that we're going with Jesus. We're going with Jesus. We can't guarantee what Southfield's going to look like in five years. But we can guarantee, we, well, we can't guarantee this, but here's our aim. In five years, whatever Southfield looks like, it'll be marked by a sweet spirit of fellowship with Jesus. That's what we want. So finally, we should not be surprised that some love the old kingdoms and not the new kingdom. Daryl Bach says that when Jesus looked at the Pharisees, looked at his questioners, in verse 39, and he made this comment, he said, no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. Bach says... Jesus was rebuking them to their face. He was simply saying, I know who you are, I know what you want, and I know you're not going to change. You and I are called to walk in a new kingdom, even as we're still interacting with all of the old kingdoms of the world. And if we're not careful, if we have an unreal expectation of what that means, we can fall into a couple of, of, of pity parties. One way is to say, oh, this is hard. It's unfair that people don't like me. It's unfair that, that, they, it's unfair that they treat me like they treated Jesus. Jesus has already told us in the Gospels. That's exactly what we should expect. He told his followers, he said, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. If they call the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? If they're calling me of Satan, how much more are they going to say that of you? And he said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, implementing a new rule, okay? By fiat, I'm implementing a new rule. I haven't asked Ben about this, but I think he'll go along with me. The new rule is this. There is no whining at Southfield Christian Fellowship, okay? 
Uh, there is no, you know, Tom Hanks said, there's no crying in baseball. Uh, our rule is there's no whining at Southfield. What we do is we just go forward. We just go forward. We rejoice because even if we're treated the way that Jesus was, we're headed for, we're headed for a reward. But here's the other thing that I want you to think about. God could have chosen to have any of you guys live at any other time in history. If you're male, he could have chosen to have you born as female. If you're female, he could have had chosen to, to, for you to be born as male. But God has determined the day and the time and the place in history where, where we all live. And he's chosen to put us here. This is the laboratory of faith for us. This particular set of circumstances. Why? One, because he loves us. He decides that's what's best for us. But two, because it brings him glory. Life may be hard. And, and in many ways it is. But look at, look at part of the reason why he has chosen to put you and me here now today. Again, I'm going to read from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Why are you and I here at this time? So that we can be salt and we can be light. So that we can season the world and cause the world to desire Christ. And so that we can represent, it, represent Christ to the world. To let our light shine by purposely pursuing good works that will bring glory to God. All of history revolves around Jesus. Everything in our life revolves around him. No less so this kingdom that he is inaugurating. So what you and I have to do, this is one of the reasons why we, we preach the way we do in going through books of the Bible. One of the things that you and I have to do is we have to learn how to live in that kingdom. That's the great task in front of us. And he's right there with us all the way, teaching us, instructing us, and encouraging us. His mercies are new every morning. Father, we come to you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for what you are doing. Father, we bless you and we just, we rejoice, Father, for the way in which you are calling us to walk after you and calling us to be faithful. And Father, I thank you that when we do this, it's not with a sense of hopelessness, but Father, it's with a sense of joy and expectation. Father, may you strengthen us through your proclaimed word today in the name of Jesus. Amen.